First of all, I want to thank the organizer and particular the organizers and particularly to Dr. Sadikot and Dr. Sabu for inviting me and giving me the opportunity addressing you. Diabetic retinopathy remains a leading cause of uh, preventable blindness in the working age population. A projection for the numbers of people with diabetes aged 40 years or older was done in U.S. for the years 2005 and 2050. The forecast suggests that the numbers for people with retinopathy and vision threatening disease will almost triple in 2050. The number of cases with retinopathy is expected to increase from 5.5 million in 2005 to 16 million in 2050. And the number with vision threatening disease is expected to increase from 1.2 million in 2005 to 3.4 million in 2050. The projections indicate an even larger growth in the number of people with retinopathy and vision threatening disease among those 65 years or older. These are not promising numbers for the future, but on the other hand, we can say that these forecasts ignore the impact of possible improvements in prevention and management of diabetes and diabetic retinopathy, which would lead to decreased prevalence of, disease, uh, of this uh, disease in the future. So what are the promising developments in the field of diabetic retinopathy that raise our hopes for the future? I want to start with screening. The case of retinopathy screening is widely recognized and also satisfies the classic screening criteria for a disease as defined by Wilson and Jugner back in 1968 that is still valid today. It's an important health problem. There is an accepted treatment for patients with recognized disease. Facilities for diagnosis and treatment are available. There is an early asymptomatic uh, stage. There is a suitable examination. The test for retinal examination is acceptable. The natural history of the disease is more or less recognized, uh, understood. Uh, we know whom to treat. It's cost effective. The patients need to be regularly screened. But today, in real the, uh, life, the number of patients screened is much, much beyond the numbers desired. There are several key factors influencing the establishment of an effective screening program for diabetic eye disease. A majority of diabetic patients do not comply with examination guidelines for multiple reasons, including the symptoms of any, uh, the absence of any symptom until the disease is very advanced and ignorance of the eye disease in a context of multiple other health problems associated with diabetes. Other factors are uh, of an organizational kind, such as difficult access to ophthalmologic resources that represent a major logistic problem. Mass screening through regular ophthalmologic settings largely exceed the medical and financial resources available. We need to make early detection more accessible by reducing the cost and manpower while maintaining or improving uh, retinopathy uh, detection quality. In the future, this challenge can be met by utilizing widely computer-assisted diagnosis or automated detection of diabetic retinopathy in retinal images. In computer-aided retinopathy detection, the retinal images 
are analyzed by up to, uh, by, for abnormalities by using a computer. The system indicates to the human expert which images or image regions contain abnormalities. It requires the human expert to evaluate each image for each patient. In case of abnormalities, the patients are referred to an eye care provider. In theory, this system may work well, but human experts reading the photographs are expensive to train and difficult to retain due to the type of work which is evaluating vast numbers of photographs a day, most of which have no abnormalities. Given intra and inter um, observer variability, there is a need for frequent and costly retraining and recertification. In addition, the delay between the patient being imaged and the result of the reading communicated can be days. The system does not allow to inform the patient about the test result at the point of the service. In the fully automated uh, reading, the system autonomously decides whether the images contain abnormalities and which of the patients are not suspect of the disease. But there are several scientific and non-scientific issues when translating automated disease reading detection into clinical practice. The scientific issues like the sensitivity and sensitivity specificity in diagnosis can be studied and measured. But ethical and political issues are mostly difficult for, or impossible to measure. For example, is, is it politically and emotionally acceptable to diagnose a patient based upon their retinal images when those images are never seen by a physician? These problems will need to be addressed in the future. For the last three decades, managing the metabolic deregulation has been the most effective way to delay or slow down the progression of diabetic retinopathy, like in other microvascular complications. One of the few longitudinal studies which was carried out in the CCT cohort and a subset of uh, Pittsburgh Epidemiology of Diabetes Complications study aimed to analyze the clinical course of the cumulative incidence of long-term complications in the age of intensive therapy. It showed that the cumulative incidence of proliferative retinopathy was 21% in the DCCT intensive treatment group versus nearly 50% in the other two groups. From one aspect, this may reflect the powerful effect of intensive therapy, but from another aspect, the intensive control did not show this effect in a considerable number of patients. Again, in these uh, nearly last four decades, laser photocoagulation has been the effective approach in the treatment of proliferative retinopathy uh, or diabetic macular edema with sensory involvement. The strongest evidence came from two randomized controlled trials in 1970s and 1980s, the diabetic retinopathy and the early treatment diabetic retinopathy studies. It is shown that panretinal laser photocoagulation reduces the risk of moderate and severe visual loss by 50% in patients with severe non-proliferative and proliferative retinopathy, and that focal and grade photocoagulation brings down the risk of moderate visual loss at least by 50% in patients with clinically significant macular edema. In 2012, FDA approved an anti-VGF, ranibizumab, for the treatment of diabetic macular edema, the first approved treatment in nearly 30 years. Another anti-VGF, afilibercept, for intraocular use in retinopathy and diabetic macular edema, has just been approved in March by FDA, and other molecules are also on the way. It took, it took about six decades 
from a possible angiogenic factor, the factor X produced by the retina, to have a drug for intraocular use targeting the VGF, a possible candidate for this retinal factor X. Although therapies targeting the VGF are considered to, as a revolution in the treatment of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema, there are a number of limitations which needs to be addressed in the future, mainly the need for uh, repeat intraocular injections and the potential for disease rebound upon discontinuing the treatment. Besides VGF, basic and clinical research into the inflammatory cytokines and angiogenic signals in diabetes-induced neurovascular dysfunction has provided new therapeutic avenues for the treatment of diabetic eye disease. Numerous factors have been identified as potential uh, candidates. Pharmacogenomics is another area of research which opens a new era for the healthcare in the future. Until recently, drugs have been developed with the idea that each drug works pretty much the same in everybody. But genomic research has changed that one-size-fits-all approach and opened the door to more personalized approaches to using and developing drugs. This relatively new field combines the science of drugs, the pharmacology, and the study of genes and their functions, the genomics, to develop effective and safe medications and at doses that will be tailored to a person's genetic makeup. So depending on one's genetic composition, some drugs may work more effectively or may produce fewer side effects in a person than in someone else. The range of applications of genomics in healthcare is vast. It is already being used in prescribing some drugs, for example, for patients with HIV and breast cancer. There are several reasons to be optimistic for the use of pharmacogenomics, also in the field of diabetic retinopathy in the future. Back in 1982, Leslie and Pike suggested that genetic factors may be important in the etiology of retinopathy in non-insulin dependent diabetes. But there was no significant difference in the prevalence of retinopathy in the twin pairs with insulin dependent diabetes. Therefore, they thought that the non-genetic factors must be important in the pathogenesis of retinopathy in insulin-dependent diabetes. In the DCCT, the families of 372 subjects were investigated for the familial clustering of diabetic retinopathy and nephropathy. There was an increased risk of severe retinopathy among relatives of retinopathy positive versus retinopathy negative subjects in the secondary inter intervention cohort in both arms of DCCT. Such, as in, uh, such an increased risk was not observed in the primary prevention cohort. These data provide the first available evidence that the severity of diabetic retinopathy is influenced by familial, possibly genetic factors. In the Finn Dian study, the familial, familial risk of proliferative retinopathy was estimated in 182 siblings of 168 Provence with type 1 diabetes. Siblings of Provence with proliferative retinopathy had higher unadjusted risk of this condition when compared with siblings of Provence with, uh, without it. There are three research strategies to reveal the underlying genetic factors for diabetic retinopathy. In the candidate gain approach, uh, several genes encoding proteins closely related to retinopathy development are analyzed, usually in case control studies. The linkage studies analyze shared alleles among family members with diabetic retinopathy. 
under the assumption that these predispose to a more aggressive development of diabetic retinopathy. And finally, genome-wide studies, uh, association study, is a new tool used in genetic research to look for associations between hundreds of thousands of specific gene genetic variations, most commonly single nucleated polymorphisms and particular diseases uh, or traits. Most genetic research in diabetic retinopathy has used the candidate uh, gene approach. Most candidate gene studies have uh, mostly looked into the genetic variants involved in the metabolic pathways and processes, including the renin-angiotensin system, glucose-induced pathways, vascular endothelial uh, dysfunction, tissue matrix remodeling, and angiogenesis. In a meta-analysis published in 2013 by Aperi and colleagues, variations within the alda reductase family 1 member B1 gene has been found to be highly significantly associated with diabetic retinopathy, irrespective of ethnicity. The role of receptor for advanced glycation and products in the pathophysiology of diabetic complications makes its polymorphisms good candidates for influencing retinopathy development. In one of the studies, the gene polymorphism encoding the receptor for AGE was uh, related to different human look, uh, uh, HLA uh, DQB1 genotypes and the presence of diabetic complications. The polymorphism was associated with site threatening retinopathy in type 1 diabetes. In another study, the polymorphisms involved in differences in receptor for AGE gene regulation are found to influence the pathogenesis of diabetic vascular uh, complications in patients with type 2 diabetes. These, uh, there are other studies or meta-analyses which do not support these findings. Further studies are needed to corroborate these findings. VGFA significantly, is significantly upregulated in diabetic retinopathy, particularly in retinal pigmented epithelial cells, glial cells, and vitreal uh, fibroblasts. Therefore, several studies have in investigated the genetic involvement of VGFA in diabetic retinopathy. A metal analysis on this, including 11 studies, demonstrated that retinopathy is associated with GF gene 460 TC polymorphism. Analyses were not stratified by other factors such as age and gender. Significant uh, between study heterogeneity, heterogeneity uh, may also be distorting the meta analyses. In DCCT, in the follow-up of uh, epidemiology of diabetes and uh, complications genetic study, several VGFA single uh, nucleated polymorphisms showed a significant association with severe retinopathy. Back again to the study by Leslie and Pike. It was one of the earliest linkage studies, although no specific genome regions were identified. More recently, a genome-wide linkage analysis designed to identify loci for diabetic retinopathy was carried out in a Pima Indian population. A modest level of familial aggregation and suggestive evidence for linkage to chromosome 1P36 was found. The main weakness of the study was that the distribution of retinopathy scores was highly skewed because the majority of subjects had no retinopathy at their examination. Since the first report uh, reported success of a well-designed uh, genome-wide association study in 2005, more than 2,000 loci have demonstrated significant and often replicated associations with one or more common complex disorders. The utilization of this technology 
In the study of diabetic retinopathy is relatively recent. There are only a few studies on this. I will bring two of the studies with the most number of subjects to your attention. Grassi and colleagues have done a meta-analysis of genome-wide association data for severe diabetic retinopathy in two large independent cohorts of type 1 diabetic patients. The genetics of kidney and diabetes and the epidemiology of diabetes intervention and control trial studies. The meta-analysis did identify several associations that can be pursued in future replication studies, in, uh, including an intergenic SMP on chromosome 1. They also did a replication analysis in Caucasian subjects from uh, Wisconsin Epidemiologic Study of Diabetic Retinopathy. The analyze, uh, analyzes did identify SMPs, but as in previous study, no associations were significant uh, at a, a genome-wide level. A recent uh, genome-wide association study was conducted in 1,007 Chinese patients with type 2 diabetes, comparing subjects with no retinopathy and with proliferative retinopathy. Cases and controls were similar for HbA1c and diabetes duration. Assess association analyses resulted three novel logi as uh, looking for uh, as potential diabetic retinopathy susceptibility uh, genes in the Chinese that are independent of the level of HbA1c and duration of diabetes. Analyses in an independent cohort of Hispanic diabetics with or without diabetic retinopathy did not confirm this signal, um, finding. A large number of putative genes and genetic variants have been reported in the literature. However, these results have not been replicated in multiple populations and therefore no genes have achieved uh, widespread acceptance as conferring uh, high risk for retinopathy. But st studies have uh, initiated in order to target alternate um, uh, pathways such as the insulin-like growth factor pathway and tyrosine kinase pathway, which may be overactive in certain sets of patients based on their genetic composition. RNA interference can be used to inhibit the expression of specific genes, thereby providing an extremely useful tool for investigating uh, gene function. Progress in the understanding of RNA interference-based mechanisms has opened up new perspectives, also in therapeutics. The eye is currently considered a good target for RNA interference therapy, mainly because it's a confined compartment and therefore enables local delivery of small uh, interfering RNAs uh, by topical installation or direct injection. Gene therapy for diabetic retinopathy is still in infancy and is a challenge due to the complexity of the disease. Animal studies have, initi have been initiated to deliver targeted molecules using adeno associated virus. But we have a long way to go. There are several challenges, like multiple genes with possible different influences on the disease across different ethnic groups, immune response to viral vectors, lack of stable long-term expression, and lack of control of gene expression. In addition to these, uh, general problems of, of gene therapy, the eye itself provides a challenge for delivery of drugs and vectors from the systemic circulation using traditional approaches. As an isolated system with a strong uh, blood uh, retinal barrier. Therefore, newer delivery approaches include the use of nanoparticles, liposomes or iontophoresis. As to the question by uh, Dr. Shaukat Sadekot, who suggested the title of my speech, if we, our patients see in the future, the answer is a big yes. Although for now, diabetic retinopathy remains as one of the 
most complex, heterogeneous multifactorial disorder, several new modalities for screening and treatment are in the horizon. Besides the technological developments in fungal screening, identifying biomarkers would also serve to targeted screening. The major treatment challenge is to develop an efficient therapy that can target multiple pathways involved in the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy. The era of pharmacogenomics will undoubtedly allow tailored treatments based on the individual's genetic profile. Continued research in this field can undoubtedly offer new insights into diabetic retinopathy pre uh, prevention and treatment. Thank you.